Good morning, Fret Buzzards. Welcome to Fret Buzz the Podcast. We have a special guest this morning, Mr. Larry Burwald of Virginia Beach, Virginia. He's a luthier and guitarist. And we're going to talk about uh, stringed instrument setup, maintenance, and repair. So welcome, Larry. How do you do? Good morning, everybody. Good yeah, morning. So, and Aaron's calling in from uh, from Florida yep. on a trip. Yep, Marco Island, beautiful Florida. Nice day down here. Yeah, and uh, Larry's in Fredericksburg, Virginia. True that. What were you? So tell everybody what you're doing up there. Well, um, there's a guitar store, a vintage guitar store up here, that's called Pickers Supply, mm -hmm. and I visited here. 25 years ago or something and had a very faint memory of it but my good friends matt thomas and dustin furlow and kim person were playing a show up here tonight because the music store also has a venue uh -huh. and uh so i had a 1905 banjo that i wanted to sell to these people anyhow so it worked out that my wife and i could come up here for the weekend see the show meet with the store owner and it really, it turned out to be a fantastic night of music uh, because one of the things they did, I mean, this is a, an acoustic-oriented uh, music store, but it is ought to be called an acoustic music museum because he has guitars from the early 20th century. And wow. um, we're talking serious martin guitars a lot of pre-war martin guitars i mean when was mm -hmm. the last time somebody said let's go see a lot of pre-war <laughs> martin guitars oh that's yeah, incredible so for acoustic musicians this was kind of a dream all kinds of uh vintage mandolins and banjos and parts and repairs so this business has been here since 1969 and i know it sounds like i'm doing a commercial for them but i was just really smitten with this place and so before they did the concert performance, they did a thing called a tone tasting. Huh. And so they brought about 12 or 14 of the most classic of their vintage guitars, brought them upstairs into this uh, venue room and had Kim and Matt and Dustin sample them. And he would, the owner paired the guitars off, like here's a 1902 five washburn with a rosewood back and here's a 1906 washburn with a mahogany body wow and he the fellow um is is has an encyclopedic knowledge of the history of these instruments and i was really thrilled because you don't ever get to hear these comparisons people go on and on about Oh, rosewood sounds like this, and mahogany sounds like this, and Adirondack spruce sounds like this, and so on. Well, by using pairs of similar guitars, they were able to illustrate, and they had one really a nice PA system, one nice condenser mic up in the middle of the stage. Mm -hmm. They would have two people playing side by side, and they'd go back and forth. And you could hear those differences that people are always talking about. And that was very impressive to me because there's a lot of mythology in guitar land, right? Uh, all of these different aspects to the instruments. And, and uh, this guy, Bran, the owner, he'll, he knows the things like in 1942, the Martin OMs had a, a brown plastic button on the tuner. And mm -hmm. in 1943, they changed to a white plastic button, you know, that level of detail. And, uh, but the most exciting thing was to hear skilled players, A, being these instruments. And I don't think that Matt and Dustin even realized that at one point, each of them had a $40,000 instrument yeah. in their hands <laughs> you know and i was watching them and i was like don't bump that into the you know, <laughs> microphone yeah <laughs> whatever you do don't drop it you know but it was really fun and uh and then after uh that then they all kind of plugged into their pedal boards which now some acoustic musicians have pedal boards that make your shredders look like you know your small time 
Um, and uh, so uh, Matt Thomas in particular is really into the effects, but he has, mm -hmm. he has a very advanced musical abilities as a, as a player and as a composer. But he also has some very interesting use of effects on an acoustic instrument. And we're not just talking about looping. We're talking about um, octave basses that, that pick up at preset frequencies so that only when in this particular song, only when he goes to the E string, maybe below a D, does the bass kick in. And oh, wow. The PA had subwoofers, and so you could really hear it. And then he also has uh, delays, multiple delays, that put these trails, uh, you know, on the end of a note that mm -hmm. um, really remind me of certain experiments that happened in the late 60s. I mean, it's kind of not unlike Joe's backdrop. Uh, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. So... For those of you who can't who can't see if you're listening to the podcast i have a kind of a colorful trippy uh it's not a poster it's a cloth picture painting yeah, yeah it's it's quite beautiful but in any case uh it was really fun to to visit this shop and of course literally hundreds resonator guitars you know as i said mandolins banjos bazookis mando cellos on and on and on fiddles terrific fiddle room now i'm not a grass or bluegrass guy but um you could certainly appreciate that this was mecca for, for yeah. any a bluegrass instrumentalist you know that would show up here it was, it's a drop jaw-dropping experience but anyway it was a good night <laughs> that's that's incredible i would love to that's that's now a destination that i need to to stop Absolutely. in it. It's three hours from Virginia Beach. And, uh, you know, do it on a Saturday or a Sunday. Well, they're not open on Sundays. Do it on a Saturday. The traffic won't be crazy. Yeah, I'm thinking on the way up to next time I visit D.C. to visit old old friends, bandmates. I've got family up there. Just stop in. Yeah, right. I'd, lo I'd love to see that. I, I've been up to, there's a place called World of Music in... Um, just northeast of DC, um, I forgot what the town's called, but it's like right outside the city limits, and they've got a lot of weird music, uh, musical instruments like sitars and yeah, things from around the world. But this place seems like it has an even larger selection of uh, instruments to, to <laughs> see and learn about. They had, for example, a Gibson harp guitar. If if you know uh, Matt yeah. Thomas, you know that he plays harp guitar well the gibson harp guitar is not popular among harp guitar enthusiasts because sonically it's not that satisfying hmm. but visually and this guitar was a 1918 guitar it looks like a mandolin except it's you know been exposed to nuclear radiation and it grew to this enormous size <laughs> wow so it seems like it's three feet long and two feet wide that's and it awesome has 11 sub bass strings most harp guitars have the guitar neck and then typically six what they refer to as sub bass strings they're unfretted low notes mm -hmm. and um so you see people play those guitars with an emphasis on the conventional guitar neck and then alternating their thumb and and hitting some root and fifth notes and so forth mm -hmm. uh, this harp guitar has 11 sub bass strings plus the six string neck and the top of it it looks like an f style mandolin it has this enormous scroll that comes around to the body and it's just <coughs> this sort of a dark cherry red sunburst um you need to stop me because i can just you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, that that is really cool to hear about um, speaking of cool instruments like that maybe a good segue into your career um being a professional musician in luthier what's maybe what are some of the coolest instruments that you've worked on that you feel that you've you've got had the chance to really dig in and and repair upgrade yeah. do something to you know it's it's been a really fun journey and um i went into business my 
business name is Rosewood Guitar Repair. And I, in 2011, I was teaching guitar at the School of Rock in Norfolk, and they had all this uh, extra space. They had this really nice uh, 1910 building in downtown Norfolk, uh, and they had way more space than they needed for the music school. But I was mm -hmm. teaching there part-time, and I was looking at all these extra rooms, and I just thought, Man, I thought I could have a workbench in here. I could have a lot of fun. I'd, I'd already been working on my own instruments and the occasional friend's instruments. But in any case, I, I decided I rented a space from them. I started working on guitars, first for students and then letting my friends know. And over a few years, I built up my collection of tools and improved my skills. And the, like anything, the more you work on it, the better you get. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, that was 2011, and about three years ago, uh, Music Go Round in Virginia Beach opened up, and uh, I started nosing around in there and noticed that they didn't have anybody working on instruments. So long story short, I set up my shop with them, so I now lease space from them. Although I'm independent of them, we have a great relationship, and I do store repairs, but my business largely relies on, on uh, the customers that I've cultivated myself and people that stumble across me, Facebook, etc. But uh, I still haven't answered your question. But okay. We, we've got time. <laughs> we do have time. I wanted to hear all that anyway. Yeah, yeah well, it's, you know, a little bio there, uh, business. And, and for those of you who haven't heard of Larry, he has repaired, he's done two refrets for me. And he repaired my uh, broken sitar gourd or cracked <laughs> gourd. So I've I have witnessed his abilities, and he's he's actually fixed some things for me, and it's it's been fantastic. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, the sitar was unique. It was kind of like the day after Halloween. Like, mm -hmm. let's go out to the street and pick up this pumpkin and yeah. reassemble it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but not quite that bad. But the gourd which is the central resonating part of the sitar had been cracked in, in shipment. And it was just kind of, all the pieces were there. So it was just sort of like gluing together a little puzzle. And that certainly qualifies as one of the most interesting repairs that I've done. It's the only oh, awesome. sitar repair, but I work on, yeah, I, I work on um, fretted instruments. So I don't do violins and cellos and orchestra instruments. Uh, but if it's got frets, it's a ukulele, it's a banjo, it's a sitar, uh, obviously guitars, basses. Uh, I work on all of those instruments, electric and acoustics. And I continue to be surprised, and it keeps me curious and interested, the diversity of the kinds of repairs that can happen. There are typical repairs that I see over and over again, like broken headstocks on Gibson guitars. I've done more of those than I can count. And they're fun in a way because people always feel like my instrument has been decapitated. I, I need to throw it in the dumpster. No, you right. don't. <laughs> you, you glue it back together. Yeah. You know, wood and wood glue uh, can do some nice things. So um, I, I do a lot of those kinds of repairs. Um, now, right? Often when you do that, those headstock repairs, it's, it's often stronger than it was before right. it broke, it's right? It's stronger than actual wood. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a good glue bond in wood is stronger, and that's why sometimes those instruments will break again if you drop it again, uh, because and it'll break next to the glue joint. Like a quarter of an inch away from the previous break, it breaks uh -huh. in the raw wood. So that demonstrates <coughs> that the glue joint is in fact stronger but with those repairs uh it's important and i just mentioned this because this happens to a lot of people keep that thing clean keep the dirt out of it get it repaired promptly because the longer they lay around the the poorer the fit when they do go back together so mm -hmm. um those are not complicated repairs actually uh, when the when the brake is clean and and uh, you know it's a good setup, but um, the the more challenging repairs for me are things like neck resets on vintage guitars, and I continue to discover that there are so many different kinds of 
uh, neck joints on acoustic mm -hmm. instruments. Now, on our electric guitars, we see basically two kinds of neck joints. It's either bolted on like a Fender Strat Tele, or it's a set neck like a Gibson, which has its own uh, type of neck joint. And mm -hmm. it, those are certainly uh, a little more complicated. Uh, but I do more uh, neck resets on acoustic guitars like the older Martins. And it's to, it's to improve the string action because the tension on an acoustic guitar tuned to pitch is approximately 160 pounds. So that thing is folding into itself over time. And it doesn't matter how good a quality or how expensive this guitar was. It's 160 pounds pulling on this guitar 24 hours a day. And um, it's a tremendous strain. Martin was the company that really pioneered bracing strong enough to resist that pull. But even at that, the top bends a little bit, the neck bends a little bit, the joint where they come together bends a little bit. And before you know it, your strings are a half an inch. I say before you know it, it could be 20 years. Yeah. But eventually, the strings are too high, you can't lower the bridge saddle anymore. So a neck reset is a conventional repair. It's a complicated and expensive mm -hmm. repair. Um, but uh, Martin has defined the kind of joint that you have there. And the principle is that you remove the whole neck from the body and reinstall it only tilted back. So for people that know fender necks, Sometimes you unbolt your fender neck and put a shim under the neck to get the neck to lean back. And mm -hmm. that consequently brings the string action lower. So it's the same principle on acoustic guitars. It's just a hell of a lot more involved. <laughs> now, um, some of the modern guitars like Taylor have devised uh, a system in their neck that's sort of a combination bolt and glue. So much easier to uh, dissemble and reattach. So for example, on a Taylor guitar, I would do a neck reset for let's say $100. On a Martin guitar, we're talking at least $300 uh, because it's, it's an involved process. Yeah, your you time to, has gotta be, takes you a lot more time to fix. It's very time consuming and you have to do it in phases. And mm -hmm. you have to be super careful, and inevitably there's some collateral damage. I mean, you're getting a knife blade up under the fretboard at the neck extension while you've got a hot iron leaning down on the fretboard to soften the glue, and you're squirting water in it and maybe steam, and there's water running all over the place, and you're trying to soak it up to avoid damaging the guitar, and the finish is chipping away where your tools go in there. And yeah. so even after it's all put back together, you still have this detail work to do to restore little finished chips and, and uh, you know, possible damages that you may have created in the process. So that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. In a masochistic kind of way. So, I mean, they obviously are continuing to do these <laughs> set next. So... I, I assume that the benefit of having a the Martin style neck is that the sound transfers more perfectly or something fr well, you from know, the there's a, fretboard to the body of the guitar. There's a strong sense of tradition in these guitars. And the, the, you talk about branding in an acoustic guitar, there's no more, there's no greater brand than Martin. Uh, and so when people that know nothing about guitars ask, what's a great guitar to buy? Their next door neighbor says, Martin, it's the best. Yeah. And so uh, the tradition is very strong that this is the design. Now, even Martin, if you go in a modern music store now, you will see Martin guitars that have um, synthetic products all through them. The back and sides are made of... of uh, basically a Formica style material. The, the fretboards can be made of products that are synthetic plastic composites. 
However, that's the more economy price guitars. If you a brand new Martin for three thousand dollars today, it'll be solid wood sides. It'll be uh, all good woods throughout the neck, and the neck joint will be a traditional dovetail, probably hide glue, which is the same glue practically that Stradivarius was using. Um, and uh, so again, tradition is very strong, but. Companies like Taylor have really done a tremendous thing because they have respect for uh, the Martin tradition. When Taylor first began in the 70s, they were literally a Martin copy company. They were just like, huh. let's just make a Martin with a little bit thinner neck because the Martin necks were so chunky. And that was very successful, but their designs, their bracing, the neck joints, they were all based on the Martin tradition, but they pretty quickly became innovators. Mm -hmm. And um, so they implemented CNC machinery, computer controlled machinery to create the greatest accuracy uh, in areas that used to be hand carved on guitars. Um, mm -hmm. They were machine carved and yet they still use assembly work that is done by hand and certain aspects of the guitar are built by hand but they invented and developed this new neck joint which for repair people is a tremendous gift because all of these guitars eventually unless you're using you know electric guitar tens if you're using super light gauge strings on an acoustic guitar or you're using drop tunings where there's no tension under normal tension with normal gauges, the guitars collapse. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, it's been very interesting to see that evolution. And so there are some other companies uh, that are making a more modern neck joint. But it's a big deal in acoustic guitars. And, and so you look for ways to protect your guitar against that. And if I may segue into the concept of humidity, right? Uh -huh. Because right now, ding, 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 ring the bell. It's time to start humidifying your guitars. Why do I say that? As soon as you tur turn your furnace on for the first time in the season, it's time to start humidifying your solid wood acoustic guitars. Now, you know, your Stratocaster is probably going to be all right, uh, although you know necks do uh can misshape a little bit more a, a inch and a quarter thick you know slab of of ash is not gonna twist and turn but um a fractionally thick single ply piece of spruce on the top of an acoustic guitar is gonna flex and mm. so humidity is what allows the wood fibers to stay strong and normalize so i i'm not somebody that thinks everybody needs to obsess about this but you need to understand if you're an acoustic guitar owner um and even the semi-hollow bodies although a lot of semi-hollow electrics are of a plywood construction but mm -hmm. as soon as you get into the arch top jazz guitar area you're usually looking at a single ply uh, very often spruce top. It may be thicker than the acoustic guitar. If it's a nice quality guitar like the Eastman's and other modern jazz guitars. Uh, they're carved, but and they're a little thicker in the center and thinner out at the edges. But they they need to be humidified properly. But it doesn't have to be a great big deal to humidify your guitars. Doesn't have to take a lot of time. The music stores all sell. Uh, little devices you can drop through the sound hole um it's got the sponge in it that you yeah get wet they're fundamentally uh, i mean i guess there's two different types there's the sponge in a casing that's got holes in it and some mm -hmm. of them are long tubes it looks like a snake uh others are little rectangular things you drop in the sound hole then there's uh i think the adario makes a gel pack kind of humidity uh device that you don't have to recharge when you have the sponge type, it has to have water in it or it doesn't do any good. You can't do it in October and then check on it in April. Uh, it, <laughs> it can dry out in two weeks. Yeah. Also, an important point 
that I like to say about that is if the guitar is out on the stand or hanging on the wall and you put a little sound hole humidifier in it, that humidifier is trying to humidify your entire house. It ain't going to do the guitar any good because it has to be enclosed to that box. So your case is sufficient. You can put it in your case, humidify it. You don't have to never see your guitar again, but you can do it in cycles. You can put it in the case with the humidifier for a week and then leave it out for a week and then put it back in the case for a week and then leave it back out. You can rotate it. That can also remind you about recharging the humidifier. But the biggest thing that happens to acoustic flat top guitars when they get too dry is the tops crack and you get these long cracks along the grain line and they're I can see it in mine yeah right? I can see it <laughs> I'm where I'm sitting in mine as well <laughs> uh, you guys yeah. are very very bad you need yeah. to humidify your guitars right away <laughs> Yeah, I failed. All our listeners are doing the same thing. <laughs> oh, what have I done? Wait, so my my guitar doesn't ever go like I mean, I use that guitar every day. Yeah. I don't think I can put it in the case for that long. I guess I could pull out my Beater guitar and Well, just even I, overnight is gonna make a difference. So I gotta put it away every so well, is there a way to what about a room humidifier? Yeah. Yeah, let's exp expand on that idea. Most people don't have controlled humidity in, in their environment. Right. I, in this, uh, going back to Picker's Supply last night, right on the wall in the middle of the room is a humidifier that's, you know, gauge, it was 12 inches in diameter, big old gauge, and that needle was right on 50%. If mm -hmm. you can achieve anywhere between 40 and 60%, of humidity, um, your guitars and your house plants and your sinuses are all going to be really happy uh, yeah. through the winter because we all know in the winter, you know, we dry out, you wake up in the morning, your throat's all dry, your house plant is over there kind of withering, and uh, so, uh, and your guitar is slowly cracking. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm going to have to buy a humidifier. Like and today, it, uh, I know Joe has has a is a dedicated music room in his house. You can get a small humidifier or or vaporizer. The the least expensive, which you can get at any Walmart, Target, etc., is a is a vaporizer that are designed to put in the baby's uh, crib room. Uh -huh. And uh, those things uh, in a small bedroom produce plenty of humidity for all of your instruments mm -hmm. so during the winter months um if you've got your guitars in a room particularly if it's a room that you can close the door to you put a humidifier in there and rather importantly buy a gauge i mean 10 or 20 dollars maybe you can buy a good um what do they call them humidistats uh, hygrometer mm -hmm. i believe is the term that will register the humidity and the ideal humidity is 45 to 50 percent. But, um, you know, you just manage that. And if you can get close to that, great. And if it fluctuates and it's going to on those cold days when it's freezing outside and your furnace is cranking, it's going to be a struggle to maintain, you know, even 30 percent humidity. Mm -hmm. But if you make that effort through the winter, um, you're in good shape and you can leave your guitars out. Some people do their whole house because they find it comfortable and house plants and furniture and everything else likes that in the wintertime. There's devices you can put in your HVAC system as a supplement that will humidify the whole house. They, they actually hook up a, like your ice maker has a water pipe running to it. These humidifiers, these whole house humidifiers do that. So you got to decide for yourself, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're playing... Uh, an inexpensive guitar that doesn't it's not made out of solid woods and, and you know don't don't worry about it or or you can i mean it won't hurt but anyhow that's i just i just while you were talking i just typed in room humidifiers in google and they run anywhere from like 50 to 150 dollars it looks like so yeah and not even a big investment compared to the well, cost of guitars and and for 20 dollars probably 
I mean, the last time I bought, I think I paid sixteen dollars the last time I bought one a couple of years ago. Uh, if you search vaporizer, mm -hmm. you will get these devices, um, and uh, they will do the same thing, particularly in a smaller room. And uh, they're geared, like I say, towards the uh, towards the baby's room. Uh, but those will certainly humidify a small room, and they actually are less maintenance than a conventional humidifier, which they get clogged up, and you got to clean the little element in them. <laughs> if you get one of those, you want to get one of the cooling ones, not one of the heated ones. The heated ones are pain. They 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 make two different kinds for babies. There there's the ones that are cool, and there's the ones that are hot. And the ones that are yeah. hot, you have to clean them all the time. And, I yeah. have kids, so I know all about this. <laughs> there you go. You may have a couple of those laying around in the closet. There's <coughs> yes. There's this this cat in Middle Virginia named Wayne Henderson, who mm -hmm. is quite a renowned guitar builder and player. And um, he's, for example, he's built famously a custom um, OM size guitar for Eric Clapton, mm -hmm. and to kind of put him on the map as a, as a builder. Uh, he has a 10-year waiting list for his handmade guitars. So a buddy wow. of mine went to his shop one time, and he said, he's got one of these um, baby humidifiers in top of uh, like a five-gallon paint bucket, and he's put a little styrofoam ring around it so it just floats in the top of this big paint bucket, and it's constantly pumping out uh, this mist into the air and keeping, keeping the humidity right. So you can be creative with this stuff. Uh, you know. yeah, this is incredible. I, something that I have neglected. So I'm sure there are other, <laughs> we have listeners out there that appreciate this uh, wake up call. I, I'm not a priest. Uh, you don't have to confess to me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it, it is, uh, again, if, you, if you've got a, a, a quality guitar with solid woods in it, uh, this is the way to protect it. Cracks are repairable. When we repair a crack in the top, uh, or what is sometimes referred to as the soundboard of an acoustic guitar, uh, it's quite repairable. Sometimes you can see the line where the crack is after it's repaired, and sometimes we can make it almost invisible. But we also put cleats or little patches of wood on the inside along the crack. Hmm. And uh, those are necessary to keep the thing from spreading open again, but they do have a dampening effect. You know, the top, particularly centered around the bridge area of an acoustic guitar, is where the magic and the music happens, and the, the top is a diaphragm. And the more that you choke the movement of that top in any way, the less sound you get out of your instrument. So in small increments, those patches do <coughs> dampen uh the sound of a of a quality acoustic instrument wow okay so i have a, a question leading off of this so if you were to ship a guitar um you know there's obviously not going to be be any climate control mm -hmm. you I mean you've you've kind of put your guitar out there Do, is it advisable to put some sort of humidifier in the case with it one of those like sponge ones before you ship it you know, um, I hopefully it's not going to be in shipment for a month. What you do know is that it's going to be exposed to different environments. But a properly packed guitar is really well insulated because you will have padding inside the case. And I would emphasize above and below the headstock. A lot mm -hmm. of headstocks get broken inside the case. You can have your Les Paul in its case leaning up against your amp at the club and it slides over and hits the floor that impact enough is is enough to break the headstock inside your case if the headstock is unsupported so in shipping guitars you want to make sure that first within the case the, the guitar is not moving at all that the headstock is is well padded so that if you shook it it doesn't bounce around in any way but particularly in the headstock area and then uh, proper shipping would be then the case gets either wrapped in bubble wrap or poured in foam inside of a cardboard box that's encasing it. 
So all of those protections against shock of the instrument also are providing you with insulation against temperature and humidity and so forth. So um, I think it's less important to worry about that. Another good practice talking about shipping is just to loosen the strings a little bit. You don't have to loosen them all the way down, but give them like one rotation on every string to loosen them. And I use paper towels, but um, to put something between the strings and the frets. Because mm -hmm. if the guitar inside the case can bounce it even the least little bit against the strings, you get little dings uh, along the strings in your frets. And a string oh. is certainly enough to, to put a little ding in a fret if it, if it bounces against it in the right way. Some of the, the quality guitars that I see, like uh, the Sewer Electrics and stuff, they ship those things with a, with a plastic fretboard protector. It goes between the fretboard and the strings, and it prevents that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, humidity, not so much. I don't think you want to put too much water in the case when it's getting all jostled around and so on. Now, the gel packs are nice, uh, again, because they, they don't drip, they don't leak. A little bit of water in your guitar is not going to kill it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's much of an issue to humidify when shipping, but packing properly is a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So. Well, is what, what kinds of things other than humidity, is there anything that on a regular basis you should be doing to your guitar? I mean, other than changing the strings and that sort of thing, but yeah. Um, polishing it, is that... Are some guitars, is it bad to polish an unfinished guitar? Okay, polish is a, is a big deal. Um, I, I, to this day, associate the smell of Lemon Pledge with the 1963 SG that was my first real guitar <laughs> in about 1970. <laughs> and, uh, every time I smell Lemon Pledge, I go, ah, oh, yeah, I'm transported back, right? Uh, don't use Lemon Pledge. <laughs> <laughs> I used Lemon Pledge for years on that poor guitar. Uh, and uh, I still have visitation rights. A buddy of mine in Florida still owns that guitar. Um, but uh, oh, that's good. there are polishing products. Uh, you can do more harm than good. Uh, a lot of polishing products like Lemon Pledge contain silicones. And silicones are really bad for finishes, especially for nitrocellulose lacquer, which uh, most guitars before 1970 are, are, are lacquer finished guitars and higher quality modern guitars are lacquer finished guitars. And so uh, to the extent you can read the label of the product that you're looking at, the silicones are a no-no. Um, the smartest, does it say no silicones on it says there? silicone and wax free. Right on. This is from okay. your shop, <laughs> from okay. Music Go Around. Oh, music Go Around, right. Okay, so um, the polishes, first of all, do you need polish? A little damp, uh, a little water on a soft cloth um, can take away most of those smudgy fingerprints that, that, that don't look nice. Um, so you want to, it's important not just to have an appropriate polish, but also to use a cloth that's not scratchy. So beware of a paper towel, um, particularly if you have a dark colored finish. Paper mm -hmm. towels are abrasive and they will put fine scratches in your instrument. However, the shop towels, those blue shop towels you see at the auto parts places, mm -hmm. they're used on automobile finishes and they are soft and they don't scratch. Um, I use a lot of automotive products when I'm doing a deep clean on a guitar uh, where the, the dirt is really built up and grungy. I'm using a, a Meguiar's uh, auto polish compound, which is a white pasty material. Rub it on, rub it off. It really cuts deep. On a normal day to day, just clean up the product like Joe has there. Uh, the ones that I like are usually watery and white. So if you take a little and put it in your hand, it'll be, you can see how watery and runny it is. Um, and they're usually white. Stuart McDonald, who supplies guitar parts and repair tools to the industry, 
very easy to find, stewmac.com. Uh, they have one polish that they sell. It's called Preservation Polish, and I use it day in and day out. It mm. lifts dirt up. It's safe on plastics, on, on metal parts, on woods. Um, so, uh, but the, also the Gibson Polish, the Martin Polish that you'll see at retail stores, Usually the polishes that are designated for guitars are safe, uh, but don't grab your household products in your paper towels and go after your guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's tempting. Oh, we got some pledge and some, some bounty paper towels right here. Let's go. But I've got this black Gibson jumbo <laughs> guitar. Why is it all covered with scratches now? All right. Little, little pockmarks. I saw the most beautiful... Well, it wasn't beautiful when I saw it, but it was a 1950s gold top Les Paul. Mm -hmm. And um, if you've if you've seen those vintage guitars, you know that they get some greening. There's this nickel in the in the uh, sparkle of the gold top paint that turns green, kind of the way copper does when it's when the finish is broken and it meets the atmosphere. But uh, this guitar that I saw also had what looked like a really bad case of acne, and uh, only with all the uh, all the zits were green. And um, I was talking with the uh, the store owner that had it, and he said, "Yeah, he said I'm pretty sure that that this person was just using a lot of lemon pledge and furniture type polishes on it, and so every little ding that compromised the finish." was then subject to the silicones going in and eating away at the finish. And the thing looked nasty. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looked nasty. Does that affect the the sound when you have inconsistencies in the finish? Different kinds of finishes uh, do, do affect sound on guitars. I think that there's wide agreement with that. One of the appeals of vintage instruments, electric and acoustic, is that that aged out lacquer um, is thin and does not dampen the movement of the instrument. Electric guitars as well as acoustic guitars do vibrate. They do resonate. Um, that's why people talk about different woods in electric guitars. Uh, uh, in my mind, there's no question a lot of the modern guitars have very thick polyurethane type of finishes, um, and they add weight. I mean, they're so thick that mm -hmm. it like adds a pound to the weight of the guitar. And when you get a chip, you see this in <gasps> flake, and you can also see the thickness and feel the thickness of that finish. That has to be choking the vibrations of of that guitar. Um, so uh, modern boutique builders who are building expensive guitars will use old school methods. They'll use lacquer, they'll use thinner coats. So um, yeah, there's there's a couple of different worlds apart there, but um, it's one of the reasons I personally like relic style guitars. I've got a couple of Stratocasters, uh, both of them, the finishes are very thin, and um, but they feel like they feel like they resonate more. And some of that is probably just prejudices from oh, I just like vintage guitars, you know. But um, uh, some of the new Gibsons uh, that are the less expensive guitars have these satin finishes. Mm -hmm. uh, they they don't have grain filler. When you pick up an SG in the store. Uh, and you can see the grains, you can see the rise and fall in the grains. That's a thinner finish that's been less treated. Um, the traditional method is to fill that grain with a product that makes it really flat so you don't see those little rises and falls and then add finish over top of it. That makes the instrument look better uh, in many respects, but I think that that less expensive finish in the case of modern Gibsons uh, Dampens, dampens the finish. I'm sure there's lots online uh, and lots of opinions out there. But mm -hmm. uh, I own about 30 guitars and have owned a lot more than that over the years. 
and and I think there's a difference. And of course, I get to see a lot of guitars in my business, not only through my repair work, but in this music store that's constantly got instruments coming through. We're always checking them out. It's a consignment them. shop, essentially. But you, you actually sell to the store, though. The, the way the music go round works is they buy. They, they buy yeah. your stuff and, and resell. They, they don't have a consignment program per se. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Well, I, I definitely, I, I have a Sheridan, an Epiphone Sheridan 2 335 style guitar with the, the polyurethane finish on it. That's the one you, you were fretted. And yeah. then I have a I have a Gibson ES three thirty five with a nitro mm -hmm. finish on it, and I mean I know there are other factors. I'm sure the quality of the wood on the Gibson's better, and the pickups are better, but there's a huge difference in the the just the sound. The tone of it is much. It's got more of an acoustic sound to it on the mm -hmm. Gibson. Like it's double what the Epiphone has. Wow. Yeah, it has a lot more pop when I want a jazz tone. Yeah, so yeah, it's not nearly as noticeable when I put overdrive on it. I mean, the right, the yeah, are you... hotter on the Gibson, but when it's clean acoustic sound, it's very different. And I think a lot of that is the finish. You know, a lot of people, a lot of electric guitar players will say, "Play your electric guitar if you're shopping for a guitar. Play it acoustically. It's a Telecaster. It's a Stratocaster." How does it sound acoustically before you amp it up? You know, that way you're taking the pickups out of the equation. Um, mm -hmm. You're taking uh, a lot of things <clears throat> and you're just hearing what it, what it can do. I have a 1960 Telecaster with a thin finish on it. And that thing is just as resonant. And man, it just, it just speaks. And, and I've been in recording uh, situations too where engineers will actually mic your electric guitar, mic mm -hmm. it acoustically, and blend that in as like a third signal. You know, they'll do your amp, and they'll do a close mic, and they'll do a direct off your amp, and then they'll do a room mic, and then I've had them actually put a, an acoustic uh, guitar mic up close uh, to the neck of your electric and blend it in there. So wow. if you've got a good sounding electric guitar acoustically, then the chances of it being a great electric guitar are, are certainly greater. Yeah. And for those who might have missed last week's episode, we, uh, Aaron and I discussed a lot of recording techniques on the, on the front end of the recording studio, so microphones and audio interfaces and that sort of thing. So check out last week's episode. Is that 18 or? Yep, oh, 18. 18, yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway. Right on. Thank you. Um, let's see what, what about switching out? You, you do upgrades to electric guitars. Um, yes. obviously I remember when you brought, when I brought in my Epiphone for the refret, we had discussed potentially switching out the pickups. Um, and you were saying that sometimes the pots on the, um, volume and tone controls can really make a difference. Uh, well, I, on that? yeah, uh, I had kind of a light bulb moment a couple of years ago when a guy brought me a, a jazz master um, and it had this, the stock pickups in it. And uh, he said, man, this guitar sounds really dull. And I said, well, you know, that's not right. Some of these, these pickups are pretty, pretty cool sounding pickups. I'm a fan of a P90 single coil pickup. So I like a large single coil pickup and um i said i agree i plugged it in and it's it was pretty dull sounding so i started nosing around it a little bit and he wanted to upgrade the pickups and i said well i said i've looked inside your control cavity and and the the pots and the caps and the switch are all cheap electronics i said why don't we just go ahead and cost a lot less than a set of pickups let's first change out your your electronics because uh that's an upgrade you would want to do anyhow if you were going to the trouble to replace the pickup but let's just do the electronics and then listen to these pickups and it was uh startling uh you know we replaced it with just good quality cts and switchcraft and i think we use an orange drop capacitor mm -hmm. and uh 
man, that guitar just came alive. And so the pickups were fine. There was nothing at all wrong with the pickups. Uh, so that's something in any upgrade to take a look at. It's pretty easy. If you look inside your control cavity, um, you can look at the pots. And if, first of all, if they're dime size, if they're really small, you know you've got cheap electronics. Uh, the, the, the bigger standard CTS pots and such are about the size of a quarter. Um, there's a brand called Alpha, which is widely used. It's cheap. Um, and uh, then more, the better quality products are usually CTS. There's some other names out there. Born is a British brand. But, mm -hmm. but uh, we're, in my world, it's either CTS pots or Alpha pots. Alpha bad, CTS good. Yeah, and and it's that simple. Um, people can talk all day about different kinds of apps that go in there to affect your tone. Um, uh, I hear less distinction that, but I in that. But uh, the quality of the switches, your pickup signal is passing through all of this stuff before it leaves your guitar. Mm -hmm. If it's crappy, it's gonna suck tone out of the pickups before it hits the output jack much less, you know, the amplifier down the line. So I'm a big fan of upgrade your component parts and then look at the pickups. If you can determine that you've got cheap stuff in there, and a lot of times it's pretty easy, pretty quickly, you can tell. Like I say, the small size caps, or if you see on there that it says um, alpha on it, then, then you've got cheaper stuff. Also on the switches, like on a Fender uh, three or five way switch, when they're encased, when you open it up and it's encased in a little box and just has a row of terminals across the top, that's the cheaper product. The <laughs> traditional ones are curved and have an arch. I've learned a tremendous amount today. This has been really fun to, to talk to you about all of this. Yeah, I, I would like to actually go into it more. I have questions about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll have to do yeah. a part two someday. Well, sure. And uh, I'm... I'm uh, in the music go round store in Virginia Beach, I normally keep hours weekday afternoons uh, from about one to six. So I'm I talk about this stuff all day, every day to people, and and I enjoy it. And, yeah. So. Well, we'll definitely have to have you on again. Like I said, uh, this is very enjoyable and very insightful. Um, like I said, I I still have questions. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, call me out there, man. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, call <laughs> Lovely, lovely conversation. <laughs> right well, awesome. Well, uh, to all the, the fret buzzards out there, if you have more questions for Larry or if you'd like to get in contact with him, with him you can go to rosewoodguitar.com. Is that right, Larry? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Rosewoodguitar.com. Um, reach out to Larry. He's an awesome guy, um, local player and, and guitar luthier repairman around Virginia Beach. and. Um, yeah, if you have, as always, if you have ideas of things that you'd like us to discuss in the future, if you have guests that you'd like to, us to bring on, or if you'd like to be a guest, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you can go to fretbuzzthepodcast.com. We are still working on building the website, but we're getting more and more information up there. Um, it has our contact information. So yeah, please reach out to us. Tell your friends about our podcast. Uh, hopefully, there's some useful information on here. And um, no, there's no useful information. <laughs> <laughs> I'm buying a humidifier. Ah, uh, see, wow. yeah. it's, Next week it's we're getting cold. Talk about, we'll talk about Aaron's uh, cure remedies for the flu. Right, what yeah. works for him? Florida. Yeah, I hope you feel better. <laughs> I hope you feel better, Aaron. Sitting out on the beach for a week. That <laughs> right on. Yeah, so, all right, well, uh, I guess it's time to sign out and yeah. go on with our day. And Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. Nice meeting you. Yeah, Pleasure. thank you for Bye coming pal. on. Okay, pals. See you all tomorrow. Right. Yeah. All right, see you, Larry. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Right. Some of them can, but if it's 